It's time for the Soteriology 101 podcast, where God is most glorified by his love and provision for all people. Welcome your host, the Director of Apologetics for Texas Baptists, an adjunct professor of theology and a local teaching pastor, Dr. Leighton Flowers. Welcome to Sociology 101. We're going to dive right in. We've been doing some responses to Dr. James White in uh, some back and forth that we've gone on. And I, we both had like two hour um, discourses back and forth, mostly because we're trying to play the other person in their entirety. And that just takes a lot of time to do that. I'm trying to break down some of these videos to actually cover specific topics so as to be more helpful to the listener. Because obviously, if it's a two hour discourse, you've got something that's useful in the two hour mark or something like that, then most people aren't gonna even get that far to even see it. And so I'm trying to divide up some of these responses into categories or to, um, you know particular passages or topics. And this one, I wanna cover free will because I want you to hear what James White says about the doctrine of free will. He pretty much just denies that it exists altogether. But keep in mind that even James White refers to what he calls creaturely freedom. Um, and thus, the accusation he brings that, well, the Bible never talks about free will, I could say the same thing. Well, the Bible never talks about compatibilistic free will, um, just as we might be able to say, you know, the Bible doesn't necessarily refer to libertarian free will. That's the argument. There's different types of free will that we hold to. Um, and I just want you to hear him for himself, and then we will play some other scholars that get a little bit more um, intentional with regard to the doctrines and how they can affect us and what we believe about the doctrine of free will. We'll go from there. I simply don't find that taught anywhere in, in the text of Scripture. I believe mankind is responsible for the revelation of God because they are actually able to respond to God's revelation. And never in Scripture is it ever mentioned that we lost our free will um, because of Adam's sin. In fact, you see quite a... Now, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, it, it does concern me. I saw some comments uh, online that a lot of people will listen to that kind of rhetoric and they'll go, oh, yeah, the Bible never says we lost our free will. Where does the Bible ever talk about the free will of man in this context in the first place? Where, did, where does the Bible ever use that term? It uses the term of free will offerings, which just simply mean they're offerings that are not commanded for a specific sin. And then did you see, wow, one of the leading traditionalist... Uh, all right, before we move on, let's let's answer that by by obviously pointing out that, again, both of us believe in a doctrine of freedom. Um, we may not use the terminology in the exact same way, um, but many Calvinists will say they affirm a doctrine of free will. It's just a different definition of freedom, just like there's different definitions of sovereignty. But let's go to the Scripture. Um, I'm primarily a theologian, not a philosopher, and so I like to talk through some of the passages of Scripture. So let's look at that specifically. We're here in Isaiah 1, 18. It says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though, though they are like crimson, they shall be like wool. So clearly he's talking sociological here. He's asking them to reason together. He's, he's calling them out for their sins. Um, he's, he's talking about their sins being forgiven, being washed white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they'll be um, like wool. For if you consent and obey, um, one translation says, if you are willing, you will eat the best of the land. In other words, you will receive this blessing. But if you refuse, if you reject and rebel, so there's contra-causal or libertarian freedom clearly delineated right there, as clearly as it can be. Um, libertarian freedom, by the way, is just our contra freedom is simply the ability of the will to refrain or not refrain from any given moral action. It's the it's choice. It's the it's a selection between two available options. To consent if to consent or to refuse. There's a if you consent, if you refuse. Now, some people will argue that just because the Bible talks about our ability to consent and or refuse, or calls us to consent and or refuse, doesn't mean we actually have the ability to do so, but yet God is going to judge us anyway. So even if you can't consent, God is still just to condemn you because ultimately of the imputed guilt of Adam. So because of something your greatest grandfather did, even though you can't consent, you will be punished for an eternity is ultimately where the Calvinistic system f f finds itself. And that is a, a huge, even Calvin himself called it a dreaded degree, de uh, de decree that it's, it's dreadful in the sense that it's, it's very hard to comprehend 
Um, and and he, he even admits it's a mystery. You know, uh, James White doesn't like to admit that he affirms a mystery, but it is mysterious. Matter of fact, let's hear from um, John Calvin himself in, in his appeal to the mystery of this. John Calvin wrote how it was ordained by the foreknowledge and decree of God what man's future was, without God being implicated as an associate in the fault, as author or approver of transgression, is clearly a secret so much excelling the inside of the human mind that I am not ashamed to confess ignorance. I daily so mediate on these mysteries of his judgments that curiosity no, uh, to know anything more does not attract me. Uh, MacArthur was asked, if God literally brings about everything, then how can He, we be blamed for sinning? And he answered, I don't know the answer to that, and I don't know of anyone who does know the answer to that. Burke Parsons of Linganer Ministries, he says that sometimes the best and most biblical answer to certain theological questions is, I don't know. Um, and so, yeah, there's an appeal to mystery from the Calvinist, even on this this exact point. Um, all these texts about man's incapacity, man's inability, not able to do this, not able to do that, not, oh, we don't worry about any of those things. Not, not able to do what? Because th this is where he gets real vague, and you'll see this throughout our discourse, is that he'll keep talking about, see, look, dunamai, dunamai, dunamai. Look, it says not able, not able. Not able to what? Not able to fulfill the demands of the law? We agree. They're not. Not able to earn their own righteousness through good works or right behavior? I, we agree. They're not. N unable to believe in a, um, in a Savior whom they have not heard about? You're right. They're not. So what is it they're not able to do? We're specifically asking about the inability of man to respond in faith, even in light of the Holy Spirit-inspired truth calling men to reconciliation and faith. That's what we're talking about. We're not just talking about the inability to fulfill the demands of the law. We're not just talking about the inability uh, of believing in a God we haven't heard about. We're not talking about just any inability, Dr. White. We're talking about the inability that is presumed by Calvinist to respond willingly in faith to the gospel appeal to reconciliation. That's what we're specifically talking about. And if you're not addressing that inability, then we're going to keep talking past each other. Uh, the Bible never says that man uh, gave, lost his free will. Well, it never even talks about man's free will in the first place. So, wow. Wow. Um, yeah, wow, indeed. Never talks about man's free will in the first place. Well, let's look at some other scholars, even from the Reformed perspective, to see if that's really what we should conclude. Um, for example, well, let's look at first before I play Al Mohler um, in his discourse over the doctrine of free will and the importance of maintaining a concept and understanding of free moral will in light of naturalistic determinism. Um, before I play that audio for you to hear for yourself, um, look at even um, Al Mohler's website where he says, why did I write this, The Delusion of Determinism? Um, the subversion of moral responsibility is one of the most significant developments of recent decades, though this subversion was originally philosophical or more recent efforts have, and he's just using a quote there, but here's the subversion of moral responsibility is one of the most significant developments of recent decades. Um, it's originally philosophical. More recent efforts have been based on biology and psychology. Various theorists, theorists have argued that our decisions and actions are determined by genetics, environmental factors, or other forces. Like, what, God, maybe? Because the, the same issues that D Dr. Muller raises about things being determined by genetics and environmental factors is also true, the same negative... Um, problems that come from believing that we're determined by genetics and environmental forces and other factors, like God even, also has the same negative impact on how we interact with our world. And that's that's part of the problem, is that this other forces would include a divine force or a supernatural force or a, a, a creator who is determining our actions. And then he goes on to read about the Scientific Americas out with a report on studying the linking of determinism and moral responsibility. The diverse theories of determinism propose that our choices and decisions are not exercise of the will, but simply the inevitable outcome of factors outside our control. 
A Scientific America explains determinists argue that everything that happens is determined by what happened before. Our actions are inevitable consequences of the events leading up to the action. In other words, free will doesn't exist. This is this is Al Mohler combating an atheist. Okay, and he's he's arguing for free will in the Christian sense. Used in this sense, free will means the exercise of authentic moral choice and agency. We choose to take one action rather than the other and must then take responsibility for that choice. This link between moral choice and moral responsibility is virtually instinctive to humans. As a matter of fact, it is the basic to our understanding of what it means to be human. We hold each other responsible for actions and choices, but if all our choices are illusory, and everything is merely the inevitable consequence of something beyond our control, moral responsibility is an exercise in delusion. I want you to notice this last quote right here. And it keeps coming up with this tweet share thing, um, so I'm going to delete that part portion of it. But I want you to see that section right there. Notice, if our choices are illusory, and everything is merely the inevitable consequence of something beyond our control, if that's not compatibilism, I don't know what is. The inevitable consequence of something beyond our control, moral responsibility is an exercise in delusion. That's Al Mohler. So Al Mohler's statement right here contradicts almost everything that Calvinism is based on with regard to compatibilism. Because it is an inevitable consequence, inevitable consequence of something beyond our control. It is beyond the reprobate's control to hate and reject God by every definition of the term, by any meaningful discussion and, and rational language, it is the inevitable consequence of the reprobate, the one who has been passed over, the one who is not elect, it is beyond his control as to whether he will continue to hate God and reject his um, free offer of the gospel. It is beyond his control of, as to whether he will desire and thus choose, based upon that desire, out of his control, Moral responsibility is an exercise in delusion within the Calvinistic worldview, the compatibilistic Calvinistic worldview. Now, this is Al Mohler making this case. I believe Al Mohler, when he's making this case, has a bit of cognitive dissonance when it comes to how this applies to his Calvinism. That's my argument, and I make that argument on this um, podcast that I compare John Piper's statements about determinism, his, his view of determinism, theistic determinism, under compatibilistic of Calvinism, and Al Mohler's statements that we just read. And so I want you to hear them for yourself. Instead of just um, hearing me, I want you to hear them speak on these things, and then we can, we can comment after that. So let's just listen in. Welcome back to the Albert Mohler program. You know, the whole issue of determinism and moral responsibility may sound like something very abstract and esoteric. You may wonder, you know, what does this have to say about my everyday life? Well, let's just think about some things we will all remember. Such as, if you're of a certain age, Flip Wilson, the comedian, saying, The devil made me do it. In other words, I'm not responsible for my actions. I'm not responsible for giving in to temptation. I'm not responsible for having made this decision rather than another decision. I have no moral responsibility here. And we, we laughed at it. it. It was funny. It was a part of his laugh line because he had done something naughty, but he, he said, Look, The devil made me do it as if that, that's just going to make the moral responsibility go away. Now, that was comedy. It wasn't at all funny, however, when back in the 1980s, a man committed a murder in San Francisco, indeed, of the mayor of San Francisco, and presented a successful defense arguing that he was under the influence of too much sugar and other ingredients from eating Twinkies. Since then, creative attorneys have come up with all kinds of arguments in order to represent their defendants in court, suggesting that even though the act happened, the defendant is not morally responsibility for the act. There have been people who have suggested that crimes have been committed because people saw too much television, because they ate too much of this, because they had too little of that. And it's all a matter of determinism. It's a matter of shifting responsibility. Back in the late 18th century, this was basically a philosophical issue, but now it's far more than that. In the mid-20th century, the psychologist B.F. Skinner came up with his theory of behaviorism, arguing that we basically do what we do because we have been conditioned by what we have experienced in the past so that our behaviors are actually more or less programmed by the environment. In other words, we're not really responsible for it. And the whole issue of behaviorism suggested that there are people who aren't responsible for their actions, their likes, their dislikes, their moral choices, or anything else, because given their environment and their experiences, there's no other conclusion or decision to which they could have come. These days, the determinism is a bit more hard line. I want you to think with me for a moment about naturalism. This is the worldview held by those who are committed to evolutionary theory. Naturalism is the worldview that says that everything that is must be explained in purely natural terms which means you can have no room in your explanation for a creator 
And you can have no room in your explanation for something that cannot be understood, measured, observed in a natural way. So they're having a big, big problem with self-consciousness, with uh, consciousness itself, with moral responsibility. And this is what they come down to. The brain must be some kind of engine that operates on chemical processes. What goes on in the brain is uh, the intersection and uh, an interreaction of physical matter and some kind of chemical reaction. And so there are those who are suggesting that, and they're saying this with a straight face, the brain is not merely the intellectual organ. It's the organ where all these things take place so that our likes and our dislikes, our choices, the choice to do this rather than to do that, the choice to tell the truth or the choice to lie, the choice to go here or the choice to go there, is really nothing more than a matter of the way the chemicals are coming together in the brain. Now, if that's so, here, here's what we know. We know that we're not responsible, and, and it's just true. The human beings want to escape and evade that responsibility. We do not want to have to look in the mirror and know that we are responsible for our own choices. If someone could come along with a therapeutic answer, or a scientific or pseudo-scientific theory to tell us that we are not responsible for what we do, an awful lot of people are going to buy into that and say, that's absolutely right. I simply am who I am because I couldn't be anyone else. I did what I did because I couldn't do anything else. Scientific American out right now is reporting on a study in which two psychologists have attempted to link determinism and moral responsibility. Now, this is what they did. They conducted a study in which they told certain people that they, that they were absolutely determined, that their choices were determined, that their likes and dislikes were determined, that they had no free will in order to make a decision, and thus they were not responsible. And then they tested how often they cheated on an exam, and they cheated a lot more than those who had not been given the text saying that everything was determined. Now, I'm not sure exactly what to do with this research. I find more interesting than the research itself the coverage in Scientific American. After all, Scientific American presents itself as something of the public face of research science here in this culture. And from the time I was a teenage kid, I was reading Scientific American. But when you look at an article like this, and by the way, I appreciate the fact that this particular article was forwarded to me by a listener to this program, you see that this is now entering the kind of public conversation that we need to have on this program. The link between moral choice and moral responsibility is virtually instinctive to humans. We know that we are responsible for our decisions. As a matter of fact, it's basic to our understanding of what it means to be human. We hold each other responsible for our actions and decisions. But if all of our choices are illusory and everything is merely the inevitable consequence of something beyond our control, moral responsibility is an exercise in delusion. Okay, now I want you to catch that phrase. Notice he says that choices are illusions within this worldview because ultimately you have brain chemicals, the environment, all these things determining something you have absolutely no control of. He even says choices are illusions. And every um, and everything ultimately is merely the inevitable consequence of something beyond our control. That's what he says. Listen to, listen to it again. But if all of our choices are illusory and everything is merely the inevitable consequence of something beyond our control, more responsibility is an exercise in delusion. Do you hear that? Do you hear, do you hear what he's saying? So the, the exact same argument can be applied toward theistic determinism, which is the belief not that brain chemicals and all those things are bringing to pass or controlling all things, but that God ultimately is controlling all things, that he is determining all things. And so, yes, the brain chemicals are ultimately determined by God. The devil is ultimately determined by God. The environment by which those choices are made are ultimately determined by God. And you may say, well, that's not what Calvinists teach. That's just not what we believe. We don't believe in theistic determinism. That's not our, our view. L let me read to you from John Calvin himself and from arguably the most notable Calvinist in today's you know, world, in our, in our circles at least, um, John Piper. First from John Calvin. John Calvin writes, Creatures are so governed by the secret counsel of God that nothing happens but what he has knowingly and willingly decreed. That's from John Calvin Institutes of Christian Religion, book 1, paragraph 16, excuse me, chapter 16, paragraph 3. From paragraph 5 of ch chapter 17, he, he writes this, Thieves and murderers and other evildoers are instruments of divine providence, being employed by the Lord himself to execute judgments which he has resolved to inflict. End quote. Also from paragraph 16, uh, excuse me, chapter 16, paragraph 8, he says this, We hold that God is the disposer and ruler of all things, that from the remotest eternity, according to his own wisdom, he decreed what he was to do, and now by his power execute what he has decreed. Hence, we maintain that by his providence, not heaven and earth and inanimate creatures only, but also the counsels and wills of men are so governed as to move exactly in the course which he has destined. The devil and the whole train of the ungodly are in all directions held in by the hand of God as with a bridle, so that they can neither conceive any mischief nor plan what they have conceived, nor how much soever they have planned move a single finger to perpetrate unless insofar as he permits, nay, unless insofar as he commands, that they are not only bound by his fetters, 
but are also even forced to do him service. It is very wicked merely to investigate the causes of God's will, for his will is and rightly ought to be the cause of all things that are. For God's will is so much the highest rule of righteousness that whatever he wills, by the very fact that he wills it, must be considered righteous. When therefore one asks why God has done so, we must reply, because he has willed it. But if you proceed further to ask why has he so willed it, you are seeking something greater and higher than God's will, which cannot be found. Now that goes right back to our uh, discussion with um, Steve uh, a while back about the hows and the whys of God. Notice that Calvin here, he appeals to the why. We don't appeal to the, the mystery of why. We know why God does what he does. He does what he does out of love, out of righteousness, and out of goodness. There's no question as to why he does what he does. We appeal to the how. How does God create free moral creatures? How does an all-knowing God allow for uh, human autonomy and freedom? We appeal to the mystery of how. Calvinist appeal, as John Calvin just quoted there, when someone asks why, we, we, we can simply say we don't know why. And so they, they appeal to the why. They, they appeal to the mystery of motivation. Why is God motivated to do this thing versus that thing? And so they appeal to a different mystery than we appeal to because we think the Bible is absolutely clear with regard to God's motivations because he has a holy character and he is love, and therefore he's motivated by who he is, which is a love of loving, good, righteous God. Uh, John Calvin Goss also writes in paragraph 1 of chapter 23, he writes, Many professing... A desire to defend the deity from the individual charge admit the doctrine of election, but deny that anyone is reprobated. This they do ignorantly and childishly, since there could be no election without its opposite, reprobation. It is utterly inconsistent to transfer the preparation for destruction to anything but God's secret plan. God's secret plan is the cause of hardening. I admit that it is a miserable condition wherein men are now bound. All of Adam's children have fallen by God's will. So whereas the comedian might say, the devil made me do it, John Calvin says, well, God made me do it. Ultimately, what he's saying is, God made me fall. God's the one who decreed for the fall. And therefore, ultimately, it's by God's direction, by God's decision, that men have fallen into sin, and that all that happens is according to God's will. He goes on to say in paragraph 5 of chapter 23, With Augustine I say, the Lord has created those whom he has unquestionably foreknew would go to destruction. This has happened because he has willed. Individuals are born who are doomed from the womb to certain death and are to, and are to, glor to glory in their chin. It is, a vain, it is vain to debate about prescience for knowledge, which it is clear that all events take place by his sovereign appointment. In other words, if you're not catching what he's saying on that point, he's saying it's, it's, it's fruitless to debate about foreknowledge. Because it's not just about foreknowledge. It's all events take place because of his divine determination, his sovereign appointment, as he calls it here. He goes on in paragraph 6 of chapter 23 to say, But since he foresees future events only by reason of the fact that he decreed that they take place, they vainly raise a quarrel over foreknowledge, when it is clear that all things take place rather by his determination and bidding. I ask again, whence does it happen that Adam's fall irremediately involved so many peoples together with their infant offspring? an eternal death, unless because it so pleased God. The decree is dreadful indeed, I confess, yet no one can deny that God foreknew what end man would have before he created him, and consequently foreknew because he so ordained by his decree. And it not, not be, seem absurd for me to say that God not only foresaw the fall of the first man and in him the ruin of his descendants, but he also meted it out in accordance with his own decision. The first man fell because the Lord deemed it meet that he should and I told you I would give you um, John Piper. And again, you're familiar with this quote, but this comes from his website, um, from a book that he's edited. John Piper and Justin Taylor are the editors of a book by Mark Albert. And this is at um, Desiring God. Um, you can find it there. You can also find a link to it on my, um, on, my, on my blog. It says this, God brings about all things in accordance with his will. In other words, it isn't just that God manages to turn the evil aspects of our world to good for those who love him. It is rather that he himself brings about these evil aspects for his glory and his people's good. This includes, as incredible and unacceptable as it may currently seem, God's having even brought about the Nazis' brutality at Berchowitz and Auschwitz, as well as the terrible killings of Dennis Rader and even the sexual abuse of a young child, end quote. So this is not just John Calvin, ancient guy from, you know, the mid, you know, Middle Ages. This is the, one of the most notable and influential Calvinists of today, saying that God has determined all things that come to pass. And, and he's even asked that question we've played on another podcast, where he's literally asked verbatim, does God bring about even our besetting sins? And the first words out of his mouth are yes, and then he goes on to give a defense for that. And so we're, uh, people keep thinking, or, or keep accusing me, saying, Leighton, you're, you're misrepresenting Calvinism. You, you don't understand Calvinism. 
And listen, I hope all of those who proudly wear the name Calvinist can rightly understand what I'm opposing here. I, I'm not misrepresenting, I'm not strawmanning Calvinism. Um, I'm, I'm quoting from Calvin himself. I'm quoting from the most prominent Calvinist today, at least within my context, John Piper. And he's expressing exactly what John Calvin himself taught. And, and I'm not suggesting that every Calvinist listening to this program has to agree with everything John Piper or even John Calvin ever said theologically. But if you're going to proudly promote the label Calvinism, shouldn't you at least affirm the basic theological claim over the issue that makes Calvinism so controversial in the church in the first place? The major reason we even know John Calvin's name and we know of, quote, Calvinism is because of his controversial views over predestination, over election, over free will, and over sovereignty. If you can't affirm his statements on at least those issues, then maybe I suggest you stop promoting the label Calvinism. And if nothing else, at least stop accusing people like me of not really understanding Calvinism, please. And so the reason I bring in Albert Moeller here and to read these quotes is because in the context of attacking naturalistic determinists, he's actually making a case against theistic determinism on the exact same basis. Because when you admit that, that there are inevitable consequences of something beyond our control, which is that's a quote from what he just now said, Listen. But if all of our choices are illusory and everything is merely the inevitable consequence of something beyond our control, more responsibility is an exercise in delusion. So you make choices an illusion. That's what he says. The, the choices become an illusion. And the tests reveal what impact that has on people. The tests that he's, he's citing here reveal that belief in the, a lack of control over the consequences, the inevitable consequences, where, whether that's made by brain chemicals naturally happening or some environment naturally coming to pass, or whether it's controlled and determined by, by a God of the universe, either way, you have consequences that are inevitable and that are beyond the control of the individual and therefore subverting the concept of moral accountability because you're subverting the concept of free will. And listen to what Mueller goes on to argue is the, the practical implications of this. So let me just remind you right now that there are people who suggest that determinism is true, that our experience of thinking that we are making a choice is actually a delusion, that we are fated by either environmental factors or the physiology of the brain or any number of other factors to do what we do and to be who we are. Now, the scientists who are pushing that realize they have a problem. If that is so, then what do you do with the court system? I mean, how do you have a trial of someone when the purpose of that trial is to determine moral and legal responsibility if indeed we are all automatons doing only what we have been programmed by some force, animate or inanimate, to do. Just imagine what it would mean to raise a child. How in the world would you raise a child? If, if you start from the premise that that child is simply doing what the child has to do. There's no choice. The, the child is not operating out of the experience of making a choice, but only the illusion of making a choice. The child's choices are already determined by the chemical processes in his or her brain. You can't discipline a child if the child's not responsible. You can't, you can't also teach a child if it turns out that the teaching doesn't have any impact on what the child actually does. Now, I want to tell you right now, I am not too worried that the vast majority of Americans are going to buy into this theory of determinism. And I'm not worried about that because it does run so counter to everything we know about ourselves and everything we know about our children and, frankly, we know about our spouses and we know about our families and we know about our friends and we know about ourselves. It runs counter to everything but we by intuition know about what it means to be human. Now, as a Christian theologian, I want to follow that up and say that a part of what it means to be made in the image of God is to be made a moral creature. Human beings are the only beings made in the image of God, and we are the only creatures with this kind of moral conscience. But what good is a moral conscience if we're not making moral decisions? So I, I promise y'all I'm just going to try to keep these shorter, um, and that's what I'm hopefully going to be doing. I know I'm, long, I know I'm long-winded. But um, this is from monergism.com. Um, and this is a, a one who the, the link that was sent to me by Phil Johnson and James White when we were in a Twitter discussion back and forth, which gives an explanation of compatibilism from a Calvinistic worldview. In order to understand this better, theologians have come up with a term compatibilism to describe the concurrence of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Compatibilism is a form of determinism, and it should be noted that this position is no less deterministic than hard determinism. It simply means that God's predetermination and meticulous providence is compatible with voluntary choice. Our choices are not coerced. We do not choose against what we desire, yet we never make choices contrary to God's sovereign decree. What God determines will always come to pass. This is the article that I um, remember that I used in my exchange with Dr. White um, when going over the homosexuality and how to confront homosexuals who are ultimately saying we're born this way and we can't do otherwise. And I'm ultimately trying to tell them that if compatibilism is true, then the, then the homosexual has a case to be made against them because they can honestly say, I was decreed by God to be homosexual, to have uh, 
homosexual desires and could not have done otherwise. Um, if you deny libertarian freedom, then you're ultimately saying, I was made like this, um, and I could not have chosen otherwise, which is what compatibilism is. It is a form of hard determinism. And so here's the way it's described. Again, this is their scholar. I'm not, I'm not misquoting them. I'm not trying to take them out of context. I'm not trying to straw man them. I'm letting them speak for themselves. Okay, so in light of Scripture, according to compatibilism, human choices are exercised voluntarily. But the desires and circumstances that bring about these choices occur through divine determinism. Catch that. So when he talks about desires, every time you hear James White talks about desires, ask him, where do those desires come from? Because he keeps talking about, well, that's because that's what they want to do. That's what men want to do. Okay, well, why do they want to do that? Because the desires and circumstances that bring about those choices occur through divine determinism. In other words, God is the one who ordains it. And then, of course, they use the example of the crucifixion to give the example of how God has determined a certain evil event, i.e. the crucifixion of Jesus. Therefore, God has determined all the evil events of all times in the exact same sovereign, meticulously deterministic way. Of course, we've argued here before that proof that God has worked to ensure the redemption of sin does not prove that God has worked to bring about all the sin that needs redemption. That's just a fallacy. It's like saying a police officer who conducted a sting operation to ensure that a particular criminal um, sell drugs at, two, at Thursday at 2 o'clock in this particular warehouse, that somehow proves that all cops want crime, or that all cops, um, or this, this police officer, has determined the evil intentions of that drug dealer from birth. And that's obviously ridiculous. The, the, the police officer is using this hardened individual, this calloused individual, this already sinful heart, and using that sinfulness to conduct a sting operation to get them to act in that way at a particular time, in a particular place, to accomplish a particular good thing. We give that cop a, an award because he worked to bring about that evil drug deal so as to catch that drug dealer and get drugs off the street. So we give him an award because there's motivation behind it, and he's acting uniquely in a situation to bring about a good thing. Well, Jesus is doing the same thing. He's down from heaven. He's speaking to people in parables. He's blinding people from his identity, the messianic secret. He's accomplishing his purpose and his plan so as to graft in the Gentiles, not just to accomplish redemption, as I was accused of by James White. It's not just to accomplish the crucifixion. It's also to graft in the Gentiles, as we talk about in other episodes. And so to bring about the crucifixion, yeah, he uses um, a sting type of operation. He does meticulously work in the circumstances of evil people who are already evil by their own free doing, not by God's sovereign decree, but by their own free choices, libertarianly so, then he brings about the crucifixion through those evil men. That doesn't prove that he has meticulously brought to pass every evil, heinous child rape and holocaust and everything that needed redemption on that cross. It's, there's no proof of that. Calvinists will use these unique divine moments where God has stepped into history to bring about a redemptive plan as proof texts that God determines every evil desire and choice, all of it's determined. Which, if this is true, if this, this article is true, then how does Al Mohler's statements earlier not perfectly apply with regard to how it is being applied and how it affects negatively the way in which people respond, if they don't truly feel like there is any control, um, it, it becomes illusory. As he said, it's a delusion. Moral responsibility is a delusion under compatibilistic um, form of sovereignty um, and James White's form of sovereignty. I assume James White agrees with this. He and Phil Johnson sent me the link in a Twitter back and forth discussion. Um, maybe he disagrees with Phil Johnson over this, just like he disagrees with Phil Johnson over the atonement. Um, maybe there's enough differences between these different kinds of Calvinists that whenever they accuse us of not understanding Calvinism, which I'm accused of daily, um, maybe it's just because there's so many different forms of Calvinism and ways in which they even handled even something as simple as the doctrine of free will. Um, you hear one guy saying, we don't believe in the doctrine of free will at all. The other one defending um, the doctrine of free will from, from um, his radio show. So, you be the judge. Hopefully this has been helpful and a little bit shorter and easier to contain. Um, tr trying to keep it around the 30-minute mark so that you can actually engage with all this. So uh, blessings to you. Make sure that you um, sign online if you haven't. Uh, become one of our patrons and uh, support the podcast on a regular basis. You can give a one-time gift or become a monthly uh, giver. 
Um, also, sign up to be a part of our events. Check our events page. Know that we're about to have a, a sociology summit um, in Dallas um, on August 11th and 12th of this year. So um, you can find more information online at uh, the sociology website as well as um, uh, texasapologetics.org. Um, you can find more information about our unapologetic conference with William Lane Craig, Lee Strobel, Mike Lacona, uh, Mark Middleberg, and others. Um, hopefully you can be a part of that. We'd love to have you. Blessings to you. Bye-bye. Thanks for attending our online university classroom. Remember, this is a listener-supported ministry, so please consider becoming a patron of the podcast by donating online. Join our team and help spread the word. For more resources, books, and articles from Professor Flowers, or to learn how you can support this ministry, please visit www.soteriology101.com.